All right. All right. Let's open our Bibles to the book of Philippians. We're going to jump back in the New Testament. Uh, we, we breeze through Jonah. And I didn't even, I mean, we talked about a lot of stuff, but there are a lot of stuff, a lot of things in Jonah that we didn't talk about. I mean, we didn't talk about why the whale vomited Jonah up. Uh, <clears throat> and it's solely because, as you all well know, you can't keep a good man down. So uh, so we, we just scurried over that. We didn't even uh, mention that. But today we're going to start in one of... Uh, Paul's most loved epistles, one of the most loved uh, books in the Bible, actually. Uh, we're going to begin our study of Paul's letter to the church that was in Philippi. And uh, just briefly, if you remember from our study of the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 16, we saw that Philippi was the, it was actually the first city on the European continent to have a, a Christian church established. And Paul and his, his ministry team, they, they traveled to Macedonia after Paul had received a, uh, a vision of a man calling out to him for help. And Paul, they were in Asia Minor and they were kind of looking around, where do we want to go, what do we want to do? They tried to go north, the Lord said no. They tried to go south, the Lord said no. So they just kept walking towards Europe. And on the way, Paul had a vision. And um, at that time, in Paul's day, Philippi was a uh, Roman colony. Uh, that meant it was it was full of uh, uh, Roman uh, ex-military personnel, officers, and whatnot. Uh, it was established as a Roman colony by the Caesar, and uh, because of this, there wasn't really a, a very large Jewish presence. In the city, there wasn't enough Jews in the city to uh, form a synagogue. So, without a synagogue, Paul and his co workers went down to the river. I mean, that's what you do if they don't have a church, you go down to the river. Um, that's good, right there. Just leave that. <clears throat> So, um, on their way to the river, they went down there to meet with those, uh, the, the few Jews that were there, they meet, uh, met with them who worshipped there at the river. Uh, and while they were there, they met a, a woman named Lydia. Uh, Lydia was a, uh, I have to say this, she was a dye merchant. Uh, she sold dye, uh, which was very valuable in those days. Uh, but she, was, she wasn't actually from Philippi. She was from Thyatira. But she was visiting there, and uh, she went down to the river to worship. Uh, she was a God-fearer. She wasn't a full proselyte into Judaism. But uh, Paul showed up at that, uh, the same time that she was there. And what was interesting is the Holy Spirit opened her heart to the truth, and she accepted the truth, and she was converted, and that makes Lydia the very first Christian convert in the European continent. But she wasn't the only one. As Paul and his team moved about the city, uh, there happened to be a young slave girl that decided to follow them around. Now, this wasn't just a young slave girl. She was a, a slave girl who was possessed by an evil spirit. And uh, this evil spirit acknowledged the truth about Paul. He said uh, he walked around, the girl walked around declaring loudly, constantly, uh, these are the servants of the Most High God. And everybody loves free advertisement, uh, but uh, after a while, you know, when it's barking in your ear, you, uh, you want to be able to turn off the radio. And so that's what Paul did. He turned around and he just immediately cast the demon out of the girl and uh, freed her from that evil spirit. But this didn't go over very well with her masters, her owners, because for some, uh, we, don't, we don't know how it all works, but this particular evil spirit could perform divinations through this young girl, and, and her masters made quite a good sum of money off of her unfortunate state. And uh, now all that income was lost. I had to go back to the drawing board. 
I mean, it's hard to find a slave that is possessed by a demon of divination. It's, it's not, you can't just go down the market. But it is believed that this girl, after being freed from the, the possession of this evil spirit, that she came to Christ through Paul's ministry. Why wouldn't she? I mean, my goodness, for the first time in her life, she was free. Well, as you all know, no good deed goes unpunished. And uh, Paul and Silas were then subsequently arrested illegally. Uh, they were beaten illegally. And then they were imprisoned illegally. Now, why do I say that? Because Paul was a Roman citizen, and those things were not supposed to happen to Roman citizens. But, and that's, that's a whole other story. Later on that night, instead of sleeping in the jail, Paul and Silas were singing. They were praising the Lord. Uh, that is, until the earthquake happened. And when the earthquake happened, well, it, it just broke open all the cell doors. And the jailer, the Philippian jailer, saw what had happened. Uh, he realized that there's a possibility that all of his prisoners could have escaped. And so what do you do when that happens? Well, I mean, any, any intelligent person would uh, immediately try to take their own life. Because in that day, if, if you were responsible for a prisoner and you lost your prisoner, then you took the judgment that was due that prisoner. So he didn't want to live through that. He was going to end it all. But Paul stopped him and said, look, nobody's missing. We're all here. We didn't leave. And uh, <clears throat> the Philippian jailer came to Paul, fell on his knees, and asked Paul, how in the world, how can I be saved? And so Paul had the opportunity to share the gospel with him. And he accepted it gladly. But not only did he accept it, but Paul, he took Paul out. He, he tended to his wounds, Paul and Silas, and uh, took him to his house. And Paul had the opportunity to share the gospel with his entire family, and they also accepted Christ. And so right there in just a few, uh, in, in a matter of a few days, you have the nucleus of a, uh, of a small church born in the city of Philippi. So uh, that gives us a little history of the church, but what about the book itself? Uh, the letter to the Philippians, as I said, is one of the most loved and one of the most encouraging of all the New Testament epistles, it is a, a, a book that is rich with a great wealth of Christian themes. There are only 104 verses in the entire book, but in that short space, most of the major doctrines of Christianity are addressed, they're mentioned, they're dealt with. And there are, at the same time, there are many profound statements of Christian love, of hope, of joy and, and Christian confidence in, in the God that we serve. So the book of Philippians is also a practical book uh, that offers insight, beneficial insight, to Christians at every level of spiritual maturity, at every level of spiritual understanding, uh, at any age. It's, it's, it's applicable to every believer, whether they're in Sunday school or teaching Sunday school. So Philippians is a book that's both simple, it's easy enough to read, I mean, four chapters, you can breeze through it in a day, in an hour, in less than an hour. But at the same time, it's very profound. It is cherished for its deep expressions of Christian sentiment that provides some of the most beloved verses of the Bible, like when Paul says, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. And there are so many verses that, I mean, we're not going to be able to talk about all of them, but just think, of, Paul says that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And in chapter 4 he says, And my God shall supply all your needs according to His riches and glory by Christ Jesus. These are, these are verses, statements that we hang our hats on, that we hang our hopes on. These are things that, that pull people through difficult times. But the book is also noted for its great doctrinal statements. The, the book of Philippians wasn't intended to be uh, a, a doctrinal treatise like the book of Romans. I mean, Romans is a, whew, that's a, it's a thick book. Thick, thick, thick. There's a lot in there. It's deep. It's deep. Galatians is deep. But at the same time, Philippians is still filled with doctrines. In fact, the entire argument of the book of Romans is summed up in one verse in the book of Philippians. Uh, you can see that in, uh, in <clears throat> chapter 3, where Paul writes of his desire to be found in Christ, 
not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. Now, why didn't he just write that to the Romans? I mean, that would have saved him a lot of time. Uh, but that's the point that he's trying to make in the book of Romans, and he does it in great detail, but here he just, he just tells us. He just tells us straight up. That's in Philippians 3, 9. There's an also there's a, a passage in the book of Philippians that is not found in any other part of the Bible. It is the greatest doctrinal statement that is made about Jesus Christ in the entire Bible. And we're going to look at that in chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. We're not going to look at it today, but that passage describes exactly how Jesus laid aside His divine glory, His eternal glory, and He took on the form of of a man. But most of all, what the book of Philippians is known for, uh, probably uh, by all people, is the fact that it is the most joyous book in the New Testament, which makes it the most joyous book, because there aren't any joyful books in the Old Testament. There are some good books, but I wouldn't necessarily call them joyful. Uh, <clears throat> All throughout these four short chapters, Paul speaks of inner joy, he speaks of inner happiness, and he does so 16 times. And he does it in such a matter-of-fact way that, uh, that you can tell that, that Paul himself had found the true source of joy. You know, he wasn't just mouthing uh, platitudes. Paul had not only learned to be content in whatever situation he was in, but Paul had learned to rejoice in whatever circumstance he was in. We saw that in, in uh, Philippians, or in the book of Acts, when Paul was in the jail in, in Philippi. Uh, they had just been beaten. Nobody wants to be arrested, but to be beaten on top of it, well, that's not fun. But what were they doing? Were they sitting around mully grubbing, complaining about their situation? No, they were praising. They had time to praise the Lord, and they, they had a captive audience. Hey, we can do what we want. Nobody's going to come in here. And so he rejoiced despite his circumstances. And this was part of his character. Paul overflowed with rejoicing despite all the problems that came because of his ministry. But what makes this so remarkable about the book of Philippians is the, is the circumstance in which the book was written. Uh, it is a joyous book, but Paul wrote it while he was a prisoner. He was in jail again. Paul's more of a jailbird than most people out there. I mean, this was like, uh, what is it, strike three, three strikes and you're out? Paul was on strike four at least. Uh, he had been in prison for some time, and, and at this point in his life, he was still being held in Caesar's jail in Rome without any hope of getting out of there. Paul had survived a perilous storm at sea. Uh, at this point in his life, he had been deserted by most of his friends, and he was facing possible execution for his faith in Jesus Christ. And yet, and yet, he was able to sit down and write out this letter that is filled with joy. Like no other epistle in the New Testament. What was Paul's secret? How could Paul be joyful in the midst of such difficult circumstances? Well, we'll find that out just by studying this letter. So in a, in a special way, um, <clears throat> Philippians actually reveals the mind of, of Paul. Paul's mind was filled with peace, and, and he rejoiced in just having the opportunity to preach the gospel. That's what he desired to do. And, and we know from the book of Acts that he did it everywhere he went, even when he was in jail. You pity the poor soldier that got chained to Paul because that guy heard the gospel for four hours. And then the next guy, that guy heard the gospel for four hours. I mean, they couldn't do anything to Paul. They couldn't, they couldn't shut him up. All they could do was hold him down. Paul was like, fine, I'm, I'll talk to you. I'll talk to the next guy too. That's where he found his joy. His <clears throat> Paul was writing this letter in the last years of his life, facing possible execution. How in the world could he have joy at a time like that? What was his secret? What key had he found 
that enabled him to do that? Well, the secret is simple. The secret is simply this, that Paul had filled his mind with Jesus Christ. Paul's mind was focused on Jesus and the things of God. Now, <clears throat> scientists tell us that the human mind cannot think of two things at once. Um, you can't be thinking about the pain in your back and dwelling on the, the joys of Hot Fudge Sundays at the same time. You're either going to think about one or you're going to think about the other. You can't think about both. And <clears throat> thus you can't be thinking about all of your life's problems while you're thinking of Jesus Christ. And Paul knew this. And so what did Paul do? Paul chose to fill his mind with Christ. And we see this most clearly in the number of times that Paul refers to Jesus in the book of Philippians. The name Christ or Jesus Christ occurs 17 times alone in chapter 1. That's, I mean, that's, that's almost tw uh, two times or once every two verses. Paul speaks of joy many times, but that theme is greatly overshadowed by the number of references to Jesus. So we will discover in this book that Paul longed to know Jesus. You say, well, I, he was a Christian. Well, yeah, he knew Jesus, but he wanted to know him more. He wanted to dig deeper. He wanted to understand him more because he wanted to be like him more. Paul didn't just long to know Jesus. He longed to know him well. Even to the point where we understand that Paul in his earthly life, he achieved many things before he came to Jesus Christ. He was a rabbi. Uh, he was very successful in the Jewish religion. We even, uh, it is even believed that he was part of the Sanhedrin, which was the, the highest political office in the nation. He achieved many things, humanly speaking, but after Paul came to know Jesus Christ, We'll see in the book of Philippians. He counted all of those things as garbage. They're, they're dung. They're waste. It's, it's worthless. He says, I count all of these things as garbage compared to the excellence of the knowledge of Jesus Christ, my Lord. That's what he desired to discover. That's what he desired to know. He wanted to know Jesus Christ better. And we see that displayed in his writings. And how... We, as God's people, need to learn this truth. You know, I've, I've been in church all my life. Uh, you know, you wouldn't believe how much <laughs> time I've spent in church. Uh, I wouldn't believe how much time I've spent in church. Uh, there were times where we actually lived at the church. Uh, so uh, I, my earliest memories are going out into the playground and picking up garbage at church, you know. <laughs> Yeah, this is fun. Uh, <clears throat> praise the Lord. Uh, but all the all the all my experience in church, there's a lot of times where you meet people in church that are not quite happy. They're not quite a joy to be around. You know, I can't say, I can honestly say that everybody brings joy. You realize that everybody brings joy. Some people bring joy wherever they go. Some people bring joy whenever they go. So either way, joy is happening. Uh, but there are some people that you just wish, uh, you know, just don't go away mad. Just go away. You know, you're, you're bringing me down. You're, you're bringing me down. But that's, that's not the way it is supposed to be for Christians. Christians are not meant to be mully grubbing. You know what that is? Budaean griping, arguing, fussing all the time. You see that a lot, too often in church. Christians are meant to be filled with love. They're meant to be filled with joy, with peace, with all of those virtues that are a result of Jesus Christ living within us. Now, you might be sitting out there and you might be thinking, well, that's just, that's a good idea. I mean, that's, but that's the ideal. That's not reality. That's something that's possible for a man like Paul or some super Christian, but not me. You don't understand my life. You don't understand the problems that I face, the difficulties that I have. You don't understand my circumstances. Well, I guarantee your circumstances aren't as bad as Paul's. 
But here's the thing. If we are able to fill our minds with material things, which, believe me, we can do that at the drop of a hat. And we do do that. But if we can fill our minds with material things, then we can also fill our minds with Christ. It is possible. It's just got to be done. We should be so preoccupied with Christ that we see him in everything. You know, a kid that is preoccupied, a kid that loves chocolate, they'll, they'll think about chocolate, even if they just see something brown. Oh, it's got to be chocolate. Got to be chocolate. I want some chocolate. But that's how we should be with Jesus Christ. We should see him in everything, in every situation. We should see him in nature. We should see him in our relationships. Say, well, not all my relationships are good. Well, we can see God moving in those relationships. We should be able to see Jesus Christ in our victories and our triumphs, but we should also see him in our sorrows. To be filled with Christ is the secret of real Christian living. It's not an ideal. It should be the reality. It's the secret of finding true happiness in our lives. And I hate to use that term. Uh, happiness is so fluctuating, you know. You wake up in the morning, well, you're not happy. Uh, but yet, oh, you got my favorite cereal on the cat. Oh, I am happy. Oh, but there's no milk, so I'm not happy. Oh, well, I'm going to make it to work on time. Yay, but I got a flat tire. Ugh, so up and down, up. Happiness comes and goes. It comes and goes because of our circumstances. But joy, joy is different. Joy is consistent. Joy is there because of Jesus Christ. So being filled with Christ is the secret to true joy in our lives. So of course, the book of Philippians reveals to us the mind of Paul, but it only does so because more importantly, the book of Philippians is an open door into the mind of Jesus Christ. Philippians tells us what he was thinking, what his thought processes were as he came to this earth. <clears throat> the book tells us uh, why he came to this earth. There are very few passages in the Bible that give us a, a comparable picture of the, the thinking that he went through. There's nothing like this in all the great doctrinal books. Uh, the book of Romans, the book of Galatians, they all teach the meaning of of his coming. They teach the significance of his life, his ministry, his death, and his resurrection. All important things, but they don't tell us much about the working of his mind. What was he thinking when he came, when he set aside his glory? What was his thinking when he came down and, and took upon the form of a servant? These insights aren't given to us in the, in the doctrinal books. They're not given to us even in the Gospels. Because the, the Gospels are a record of what Jesus said. They're a record of what he did, but they almost never record his thoughts. And so the book of Philippians is unique. <clears throat> it is personal. It gets down to brass tacks. Let me just read a passage. We're not going to deal too much with it because we'll get there eventually. Philippians chapter 2 Let's read verses 6 through 8. Speaking about Jesus Christ, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant, and coming in the likeness of man, and being found in an appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. This passage tells us that Jesus' is coming to this earth involved two things, two very important things, two things that he had to swallow, so to speak. Number one, it, it speaks of humility. And secondly, it speaks of obedience. And, and the humility that we know and love. We all love humility. We like to talk about it, but we like to practice it, don't we? Don't we? Yeah, I've never met anybody that likes to practice humility. Uh, it's important, but we, and we do like to study it, 
and then we just set it aside and yeah, I'm just going to do what I want. Uh, but humility consists of two parts. Uh, number one, it, it consists of giving up something that we have. And secondly, more importantly, not only do we have to give up something that we have, but we have to be willing to receive something that appears to be inferior. I'm going to give up this good thing so I can get this second thing that's not that good. And that's really, it goes against human nature. Let me, let me just say that. Yeah, you give a kid a candy bar. Hey, why don't you give me that candy bar and I'll give you this broccoli. That kid's going to look at you like you got two heads. What are you talking about? Even if I was starving, I wouldn't take your broccoli. Many of us only give up something if we think we're going to get something better in return. Right? I mean, you always want to trade up. <laughs> but most of us don't want to give up anything at all. I mean, our, our human nature is to hoard things and to constantly try to add to what we have. That's, that's human nature. I'm the wor world's worst about lumber. My goodness. Uh, I've got bare buckets of lumber in my attic. Oh, I'm, I'm going to use this one day. I'm going to use this one day. I don't want to throw You know how expensive lumber is nowadays? My goodness. If I have to piece that stuff together, I'll do it. <laughs> Nobody's going to see it. Nobody's going to see it. I'll cover it up. So, yeah, I, I'm digging around in my attic. I'm like, Look at all this lumber I got. I, you like to keep it. You got to keep, got to keep what you have. But Paul tells us that Jesus did neither one of these things. Instead of hoarding what rightfully belonged to him, his eternal glory, Jesus willingly laid it aside, his power, his honor, even his omniscience. And what did he do? He took on the form of a man. That is a major downgrade. But Paul also says that Christ emptying himself involved obedience as well. He did this out of obedience to the wishes of the Father. Now, do you ever consider what carried Jesus to the cross was obedience? Now, we always assume, and rightfully so, that it was his love that carried him to the cross. And it was, but he did it out of obedience. Not only because he loved us, but because he loved the Father. And it was this obedience that didn't always come easily, as we can tell by the struggles that he had in the Garden of Gethsemane. But Jesus was obedient to the cross. And because he was obedient, the Father exalts him up to the highest place. We'll see that in verse 9. So, since the book of Philippians reveals to us the mind of Paul, and it also gives us insight into the mind of Christ, well, it would be helpful if the book of Ephesians or Philippians would speak to the mind of the believer. But does it? Does it speak to our minds? Well, yes, it does. Look back where we were in chapter, uh, chapter 2. Let's look at verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Oh, my goodness. All those good things we talked about Jesus just a few minutes ago, Paul is saying, hey, that's got to be us. That should be us as well. We should be willing to put on the mind of Christ, which means we should be willing to emulate what Jesus Christ does. The mind of Christ and the mind of the believer should be the same. Our minds should dwell on the same things. Jesus is the pattern, and we, as his followers, as his disciples, we should be like him. We should desire to be like him. And for Jesus, this meant emptying himself in obedience to God the Father, but for us, it means centering our lives on Jesus Christ. That's what he's called us to do. Now, let me illustrate this from astronomy. I'm not an astronomer. But I, I can read. So <clears throat> for thousands of years, you may not know this, <clears throat> but for thousands of years, people believed that the moon and the sun and the planets and the stars all revolved around the earth. I mean, you see them spinning. <laughs> you go out in the night sky, you can see the stars going around. Oh. It's, it's only natural to think that everything revolves around the earth. We call that a geocentric idea. 
But it, it, it came to be known as the uh, Ptolemaic system because it was codified by a man named Ptolemy. Uh, and if you can spell that, you get extra points. Uh, it's like trying to spell Chapatulus. It starts with a T. Ptolemy starts with a P, believe it or not. Now, the Ptolemaic system was a pretty good system because uh, more so than what people give it credit for. It could forecast the hours of sunrise and the sunset. It could chart the movements of the planets to some degree. It was able to do quite a lot of things in astronomy, but it did have some problems. Uh, the biggest problem it had was that it was completely wrong. As we all know, the sun is the center of the solar system, not the earth. And thus, it's inevitable that the system that was based on having the earth as the center of the solar system, well, obviously, this thing's going to have some defects. It's going to come up with some problems. First, it wasn't always accurate in, in charting the position of the planets. Yeah, it could, it could foretell some stuff, but it, it really had problems when a, when a planet was in retrograde. Uh, how did that happen if it's, if it's uh, circling the, the earth? And so under the strain of these constant corrections, uh, the system eventually broke down. People just realized, nah, this is, this is not going to work. We've got to come up with something different. But also the, the Ptolemaic system didn't allow for progress. Uh, for those that held to it, they were stuck with that problem. New discoveries always went against the Ptolemaic system. That always, uh, anything that they discovered actually pointed to the fact that it was wrong. And it wasn't until Copernicus came along and established this system of the sun being in the center of the universe. Uh, that allowed New uh, Newton's theory of gravity to be developed. And in fact, it's the only way we have spacecrafts flying around us because we realize that it, the sun is the center of the universe. But what does that mean? for us. How does that apply to us? Well, each one of us, whether you know it or not, each one of us live in a spiritual solar system. And that solar system is just as fixed as the one that fills our heavens. You say, well, I, I've never seen it. Well, guess what? I'm, <laughs> I've never seen our solar system either, but it's out there. But in our spiritual solar system, Jesus Christ is the center. Unfortunately, many people believe that they are the center of their system. And as far as they can tell, well, that system works pretty well. They serve themselves and generally they get what they desire. If they work hard enough for a home, well, they'll get it. You know, if circumstances go their way. They work hard enough at their job and they have certain abilities, well, they can, they can count on certain, a certain measure of success. So it is possible to get by in this world with yourself as the center of your universe. But like the Ptolemaic system, this human-centered system has defects. First, it's not quite accurate. In fact, it's completely wrong. Yes, it can predict a certain measure of success, but it doesn't account for failure in our lives. There, there are some people out there that work themselves to death and they don't achieve anything. This human-centered system doesn't account for the inevitable letdown that people experience when they finally achieve what they always wanted. Yay, I got it. Eh. The next day, okay, now what? They realize, eh, it's not that big of a deal. I've wasted all of my life. And also the system of the natural man doesn't allow for progress. Human beings are severely limited. We don't like to think that, but it's true. There's not a whole lot we can do. That's why we, we, we uh, idolize the, uh, the superheroes. We make movies about them. We make books about them. Oh, everybody wants to have superpowers. Why? Because nobody has superpowers. We're limited, severely limited. And any system that makes us the center of our lives will also be limited. But you see, it's not that way for Christians. It's not that way 
for the believers. It's not that way for those who see things the way God wants everyone to see them. See, before God, humanity is abased and Christ is exalted. And Jesus Christ is the center of the spiritual solar system. He is the center of the spiritual universe, for that matter. And the Bible teaches us that this system has unlimited progress, infinite progress. Uh, the Bible goes so far to say you can't even imagine what God has in store for us. And it is that way because it's based on reality and it's based on the nature of an infinite God. And so the question that we have to ask ourselves is, do we know where we stand before God? Are we willing to accept Jesus Christ's rightful place as the center of our own personal spiritual solar system? I pray that each one of us can say that for a fact. So this kind of gives you an idea of how we're going to progress through the book of Philippians. We're going to read verse 1, and we're going to get through half of that verse. So let's jump right in and get our toe wet in the book of Philippians, chapter 1, verse 1. And Paul writes, Paul and Timothy, bondservants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi, with the bishops and the deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I threw that in there because you can't really have an introduction without you know, the prayer that goes along with it. But believe me, we're not going to get to chapter, or verse 2 today. So Paul begins his letter... Uh, just as any ancient writer would, he identifies himself. Uh, he identifies those who are with him. Uh, he does that for the benefit of the recipient of the letter. And then he identifies those who are the intended recipients, that being the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi. But you see, Paul is more than just an ancient writer. He's writing a letter, and so it looks like a letter. But he's doing more than just writing a letter. Paul is not just a, a writer, he's also a Christian. He is also a theologian. And thus, when he writes these things, he writes them not as a mere civilities. He's not just being nice. Uh, Paul is trying to communicate Christian truth to his readers. He's trying to teach the deepest and most uh, significant things about Christian relationships. And so the first thing we want to notice is that when Paul introduces himself and he introduces Timothy, what does he say about himself? What does he say about Timothy? He says, Paul and Timothy, bond servants of Jesus Christ. Paul uses a word that literally means slave. Now, slavery has gotten you know, is, is, is frowned upon nowadays. And rightly so, I would say. Uh, rightly so. But what Paul is saying here is that he was a slave of Jesus Christ. And he wishes to serve Jesus as an obedient servant serves his master. Now, Paul's not just saying this about himself. No doubt he is implying that what was true of himself should also be true of every other Christian. Paul doesn't separate himself from us regular Christians because in Paul's mind, he was a regular Christian. In Paul's mind, he was worse than a regular Christian. Now, in 1 Corinthians 6, 20, Paul teaches that, uh, that we are not our own, that we have been bought with a price. And so because of that, we are to glorify God in our bodies. We are, glor we are to glorify God in our spirits, which actually belong to God. So Paul is, is presenting here a spiritual law, uh, and it's one that we know to be true, that no one can become a servant of Jesus Christ. No one can become a slave of Jesus Christ until they first realize that by nature, by just natural occurrence of being born, 
We are already slaves to sin. Now, in, in Paul's day, in ancient times, there were three ways a person could become a slave. Uh, none of them were good. Number one, you could become a slave by conquest. You know, if you happen to go to battle and you were just on the wrong side and your team lost, well, you didn't just go to the locker room, take a shower and go home. No, <laughs> you got carried off into captivity. You became a slave. You were a soldier one day. Now you're a slave. You belong to somebody. Unfortunate. You hate it. I hate it when that happens. Uh, but it happened all the time. That's why there were so many slaves in Rome, because Rome never lost. You know? They always won. So if you survived, guess what? You had a new job. Secondly, you could become a slave by birth. If it just so happened that your parents were slaves when you were born, eh, guess what? You're a slave too. That was your inheritance. Any child born of slaves automatically became a slave as well. And then there was a possibility, thirdly, that you could become a slave because of a debt. You, know, you owed somebody some money. How do you clear up your debt? Well, you just became their slave. Uh, a lot of poor people sold their children into slavery in order to pay a debt. Hmm. I didn't realize that was an option. Man. But in those days, it was so common that the Jewish people even had laws to, to lessen the force of this particular custom. You read in the book of Leviticus, every 50 years in the year of Jubilee, anyone who had become a slave because of a debt was automatically set free. <clears throat> of course, if you, if you did that when you were 13, whew, it's a long way to go. But, uh, but still, there was, there was options of getting out of it. <clears throat> so it's, it's against this historical background that it's interesting that the Bible teaches that all men have become slaves to sin in the same ways. The Bible teaches that all humans are born in sin. David even writes, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. And, th and this teaches us that there was never a moment in David's life when he was not a sinner. There was never uh, a part of him that was free from the uh, contamination of sin. He, he, he recognized that it started right at the very beginning, before he even took his first breath. But the Bible also says that we are slaves by conquest because the Bible teaches us that sin rules over us so that we can't do the things that we know we should do. In the book of Psalms, David prays for deliverance from willful sins, asking the Lord that they not have dominion over him, that they not rule over him. Solomon speaks of the sinner being bound by the cords of his sin in the book of Proverbs. But then there's also the fact that we are sinners by debt as well. And that's the reason in Romans 6.23, Paul speaks of the wages of sin. He's telling us there that the, the, the account of my sin can only be paid by death. The wages of sin is death. And Paul knew that he had been a slave to sin in each of these three ways. And every other person must also realize the same thing is true about themselves in some form before they can ever hope to experience God's deliverance from sin. You know, a person has to realize that they're sick before they're going to go to the doctor. And if you're a man, you even have to realize more than that. I'm not just sick, but I'm really sick. <laughs> I don't have time to go to the doctor. Well, you better make time. So in the same way, a person must know that he is enslaved spiritually before he'll ever attempt to turn to the one who alone can set him free. But just as there are several ways of becoming a slave in ancient times, so there were also several ways of becoming free from slavery. A person could earn their freedom. A person could buy their freedom. Or... Their freedom could be given to them by someone who was able to pay the price of their redemption. Three ways 
Three ways to get in, three ways to get out. But although there were three ways of becoming free from slavery in ancient times, in spiritual terms, in terms that we're speaking of today, in the terms that we experience, there's really only one way of being free from sin. There's only one way of experiencing deliverance from the guilt of sin. And that one way is to be bought by the one who alone could pay the price of sin. You see, there's no way possible that anybody could ever buy salvation. There's not enough money in the world to pay for that. Even uh, Bill Gates would come up short. No one will ever earn their salvation because we can do nothing that will merit God's grace. Even the good things we do, the Bible tells us our righteousness the good things we do are filthy rags before God. So how in the world could we hope to merit God's grace? So, but here's the thing. What we can't earn and what we can't buy, God will freely give to us on the basis of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. God is going to offer us a free gift, a free gift of salvation. Now the Bible does say that the wages of sin is death, but it also teaches that Jesus paid that required price for our sins when he died on the cross of Calvary. And that's why Paul could go on to say in Romans chapter 8, verse 1, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. This is a great deliverance. And Paul knew it perfectly. Paul knew it personally. He had experienced it. Now, someone who hasn't experienced this redemption from grace, they may argue that, it, hey, this, you're just changing one slave owner for another master. But that's, a, that's kind of a gross misrepresentation here. You say, well, I was a slave to sin. Now you want me to be a slave to Jesus Christ? Well, yeah, but it's, it's not as bad as what you think it is. Because no Christian would ever compare the two except in the terms of being uh, our, our total allegiance. Realize it or not, before Jesus Christ, you were totally committed to sin. I mean, no one had to twist your arm to do bad things. You don't have to teach your children how to lie. They come by it naturally. You don't have to teach them how to do bad things. They just, that's, that's what kids do. Why? Because they come from us. That's what we do. It's true that we've been uh, slaves to sin, just as everyone is. But now, now we're servants of Jesus Christ. And this is a, a different relationship because this, this new service isn't like the old service at all. Our new master isn't anything like the old master of sin. Yes, it is a bondage, but it is a bondage of love and gratitude, it is a relationship that is comparable to marriage. If you're married, you know you're not autonomous. In, you, you know you just can't do what you want. You're not free to marry someone else. You're not free to leave home. You're not free to abandon your spouse. But you are still free. You are free to serve. You're free to give. You're free to love your family. To lift them up. To encourage them. And it's the same thing with the rule of Jesus Christ in the life of the believer. It's the same thing of his rule over you. Because he is our Lord and we are his bride. Right? At the same time, he is the master. And you are his to do his bidding. But this will never be slavery in the concept that we hold of slavery today. In fact, this bondage is the only way to experience true joy. It's the only way to experience true peace. It is the only way to experience genuine spiritual satisfaction to be a bondservant of Jesus Christ. That is what we were created to do. That is what we were saved to do. And if we fail to align with that, well then we'll never be satisfied. We'll always be 
mully grubbing, arguing, because we're not where we need to be. Paul not only recognized that he was a servant of Jesus Christ, but he also recognized that every other believer needs to be in that position. But before a person can have the mind of Christ, before they can ever have Jesus as the rightful and only acceptable center of their life, they must first accept him as their Savior. <clears throat> they must acknowledge that they have a need of him in their life. They must recognize that they are spiritually bankrupt, lacking anything that would merit God's love and grace, possessing everything that would gender his judgment and his wrath. Paul even tells us in the book of Ephesians that we are by nature children of wrath. And we didn't even have to do anything to be titled like that. We were just born children of wrath. And there's no way to spin that in a positive way. I mean, there's um, so much news today, they, bad news, they try to spin it in a positive. You can't spin this any way but what it is. Children of wrath. We are naturally opposed to God, so we should naturally expect to feel his wrath. That is what we have earned. That is what we are owed. And that is what we have coming to us, apart from Jesus Christ. If we're going to, I'm going to do it my, I'm going to do it my way, as the old song says. Well, guess what? Guess what's coming your way? But you see, that's not what God wants for us. God desires to extend forgiveness of our sins. God ex uh, desires to exchange the guilt of sin for His grace. God wants to exchange His judgment for His love. That's what He wants to give to us. And God is able to do this, and He's only able to do this because the price for our sin was paid by His Son when He died on the cross. And so now, he offers us salvation, not because we earned it, not because we can afford to buy it. He offers us salvation as a gift. And the only way to appropriate a gift, the only way to make that gift your own, is just to reach out and take it. Take it from the hand uh, of the one who is offering it. The only way to make God's forgiveness of sin effective in your own life is to recognize that you need it and then to invite Jesus into your life as your Lord and Savior. Let's stand. <clears throat> we'll be looking at the mind of Paul. We'll be looking at the mind of Christ. But what we really need to be conscious of is our own mind. And we need to allow the mind of Jesus Christ to become our way of thinking, our way of living. <clears throat> Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we stand before your throne today. Lord, with the understanding that we are only here by your grace. Lord, that uh, by nature we are children of wrath. But Lord, you have extended forgiveness, and grace, and love, and mercy our way. And Lord, for everyone who has received it, we have been brought into a new relationship with you. <clears throat> a relationship that is built on love, and trust, and humility, and obedience, Lord. Those are the characteristics that are expected from individuals who are filled with Jesus Christ, who are following Jesus Christ. Lord, it is our duty, it is our goal to be like Him. That's what it means to be a Christian. It means to be like Christ. Lord, that's what we desire. And we pray that as we make our way through the book of Philippians, Lord, that You would open our eyes to... <clears throat> the characteristics that, that He models for us, that He examples for us. Lord, help us to not just see them. Help us to not just understand them. 
Lord, but help us to walk in them, to make them part of our lives, to make them our characteristics. So that when people see us, they'll say, that person looks like they've been with Jesus. That person is different. Why are they different? What is it about them that makes them different from everyone else? Well, it has nothing to do with us, but it has everything to do with you. And Lord, we, we pray that your truth, that your spirit, that your reality would be manifested in our lives as we go about our business every day. Lord, that your characteristic will be revealed in us and by us for others to see so that we might draw people to the truth of Jesus Christ. And Lord, if there's anyone here today that has never uh, invited Christ into their hearts, I pray that they would see their need and they would take that step to accept Christ as their Savior. Lord, help us to, to understand where we stand before you and, and to acknowledge our, our great need of you. Even for believers, Lord, we still need your presence. We need your Spirit working in us, guiding us, directing us, empowering us, enabling us, Lord, to do what you've called us to do. Lord, it's all your work. We just desire to cooperate with you in it. Be with us as we leave today, Lord. Watch over us, the weather and the traffic, Lord. Keep us safe. Keep us in your will. Uh, Lord, and, and I pray that you would instill within us a greater desire to know you for who you are. And we ask all these things in Christ's name we pray. Amen. 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 Amen.